in here. Let's get that fired up. Um, so it's so nice to be back uh, going to in-person SQL Saturdays again. Uh, went to SQL Saturday San Diego, had a couple dozen people in the pre-con workshop, um, and uh, then a couple hundred people at the event as well, which is nice. It's just been really hard getting those local events uh, up and running again after the pandemic. So many people, I kind of think of it as like the, there's a whole generation now of young data professionals who have gotten into data without ever going to an in-person event. Uh, they maybe graduated college around 2020. Uh, they didn't go to any in-person events. They maybe didn't even go to in-person things at their company. Uh, they're not used to seeing conferences. Uh, and now we kind of have to remarket conferences and in-person user events uh, to those people again so that they see the value of networking personally, uh, seeing the sessions in person, how much more valuable that is when you get to connect the dots with people directly. It's really interesting to see. So let's get to your top voted questions over at PollGab. Let's see, your top voted question comes from Deadlockinator. Deadlockinator says, uh, Hi Brent, what does S why does SP Blitz who return null in query text for some SPIDs, even when I'm running it as a sysadmin? Okay, so um, I'm going to give you a little, you know, I always as a trainer, I have to balance between giving you the exact answers uh, versus teaching you how to fish. When an open source product like Linux throws an error, that's hard because it's long and drawn out. When an open source script like SPBlitz who throws an error or doesn't do what you want, that's relatively easy to look at. You can just go open it. There's no copy protection on SP Blitz who. You can just go open up that script and then go say, all right, let's see, like in this case, you would take the column that you're looking for, uh, query underscore text, take that column and look to see where it comes from in the script. Look to see what populates it. Look to see what DMV we're querying and then go query it yourself to see if your own script returns nulls in that column as well. Then you can start to learn about how SQL Server's DMVs work. You can start to see where they produce results, where they don't produce results, uh, and you can start getting some of those answers yourself. It's not that I don't want to answer it. It's just that I want to start you down a path of learning how to solve some of your own problems because that'll be really effective for you. Or if you don't want to do anything yourself, you can go to brentozar.com and click consulting up at the top and you can pay me. Let's see what happens. I bet you won't do that though. <laughs> Bruce asks, next up, Bruce asks, how prevalent is SQL Server on Linux in production environments? It is not, not even close. Uh, according to SQL Constant Care data, it's way less than 1%. I poll every now and then when I'm at conferences or user groups how many people are running, uh, hosting production data in Azure, how many people are hosting production data in AWS RDS, how many people are hosting it in on-premises SQL Server and so forth. Uh, and I've not yet seen one hand go up for Linux. I do know that there are some people out there doing it. We've had one or two users hop in and out of SQL Constant Care uh, using it, but it's literally just been like one or two. Uh, next up, uh, Bandu asks, how many companies have you seen attempt a transition uh, from Microsoft SQL Server to Postgres? It's low, it's in the dozens for me that I've even like seen or heard people talk to. Um, but uh, the, the real problem is, is how many people have, or how many companies have I seen actually finish that transition for serious existing applications? That number would be zero because what they quickly learn is, is it's more cost effective to rewrite the applications from scratch uh, rather than change their database backend. Um, Amazon was trying to uh, simplify some of that using their open source Babelfish product. Unfortunately, it's only got uh, from Amazon themselves. I just sat through a session uh, with a couple of Amazon employees talking about it. And they said it only has about 70% T-SQL coverage uh, out of everything that SQL Server supports. It only uh, Babelfish only supports about 70%. I'd say the number's even lower than that. 
Uh, let's see, Mihao asks, do these events take COVID seriously? I still wear masks and gloves, but not many people do that anymore. I, it's less about the event than it is just about people, right? Because I take planes and trains and automobiles. I don't see people on planes using masks, but maybe like two or three people on an entire plane. It's just not something that the public takes very seriously anymore. I actually thought, uh, when, when COVID was finishing up, I actually thought that... And I say finishing up, I mean like the, the big blah, 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 over it. Um, I actually thought that I'd wear masks for the rest of my life on planes. I'm like, well, why wouldn't I? It's just a free, easy precaution. But I pretty quickly uh, got back to not using a mask either, just because it, I don't think it's really effective uh, when you're in an environment like an airplane where you're constantly drinking and eating stuff anyway. Um, if, I don't have any problem with people who do it. It's just that I don't think you can say that it's a conference thing. It's just a general public thing there. Uh, next up, my tea got cold says, is there a shorter way to say Microsoft SQL Server on Amazon RDS? None of those words seem optional. Look, you're being pedantic. RDS SQL Server, that's all you need to say. RDS SQL Server. For example, if you Google for that, it's fairly clear and straightforward where you're going to end up at. Uh, next up, Ray says, when I'm installing cumulative updates for SQL Server, all the previous updates are also installed in a cumulative update. If there are 10 CUs in a row and the fifth CU has a bug, will that bug still be an issue when I install CU10? Absolutely. If Microsoft doesn't fix that bug across multiple cumulative updates, it absolutely will still be an issue. And in fact, if you read the documentation for each cumulative update, sometimes you'll see things that say that there's an open issue uh, for the past cu several cumulative updates. It's fairly rare. Like, I can think of one issue in the 2022, excuse me, cumulative updates train uh, that stayed open for quite a while, but it's, it's you know, it's fairly rare. Uh, next up, Sean says, hey, yo, I'm in inspired by your consulting video. How would you get ops and de uh, DevOps buy-in on performance or optimization requests? Our infrastructure DBA team has raised tickets, stand-ups, pushed priority meetings, handed them all in one fix-it scripts to test with no luck. It's because it's not your job. How would you react if another team came in and started telling you how to do your job, do you think you'd take them seriously? You think their requests would go straight to the top of your chain? Probably not. You'd probably start asking questions about them before you'd start asking questions about their guidance. You just said you're an infrastructure DBA team. Well, that's not a performance optimization team. So you're acting like you're shoving things down their throat when in reality, they never asked for your help. If they want your help, they by now know where to find you. They're not asking for that help. So instead, I would focus on doing your own job. Now, look, all of us want to be able to give feedback to other teams and have them do that work more effectively. But if you really want to truly do that work, if you want to focus on performance tuning, you're doing the wrong job. Stop being on the infrastructure DBA team and go work in those development teams. There you go. Hola, Shane Ellis there in the comments. Drew says, do you ever watch any of the free Carnegie Mellon Database College courses on YouTube? And if so, what is your favorite? Drew, I feel like a, an imposter for saying this, but I've never watched any of those. There are just only so many hours in the day. And, you know, I know those people who say, uh, if I retired, someone will say, if I retired, I, would, you know, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. I'd go right back to work. Oh, if I retired, I could quit work tomorrow. If I suddenly hit the lotto, I could quit work tomorrow and I would spend the rest of my life learning and sitting by the beach drinking Mai Tais. I would love to learn a million things, but the reality is, is I can't turn those Carnegie Mellon things into money. I can't turn those lectures into money. And I have so many things that I want to do either for work to bring money in the door or to give things back to y'all. 
that I can't afford to sit around watching Carnegie Mellon database videos. It's not that I don't ever do anything to unwind. I adore playing Dead by Daylight, for example, and there's no, no money or giving back uh, to that. I'm never going to play DVD competitively. Uh, but the reality is just that when I unplug from the computer, I walk out of here and I do not do database-related stuff at all. Good afternoon, Ashish. And then we'll do one more. Let's see here. Ed Erzabet says, does SQL CLR compare favorably with Postgres extensions? They have nothing to do with each other. That's like asking how a monkey compares and contrasts with a PlayStation controller. They just, they're, they're two unrelated things. And it follows up with, what is your favorite Postgres extension? I, I focus on the stuff that's built into the engine because I want to try and teach people and use things myself uh, that have the widest possible appeal overall. Um, so because of that, I tend to not use extensions. Um, the one that I would probably use if I did it a lot, like if I had needed this a lot, was the Query Plan extension, which gives you the ability to pass hints into Postgres's Query Optimizer and Shape Execution Plans. Uh, Studley McStudface says, I'm glad you're still playing DVD. I'm loving the Castlevania chapter and Lights Out. I was on the road for Sequel Saturday San Diego, so I didn't get to play Lights Out yet. I am literally, as soon as this webcast finishes and I ship it up, you know, put it up on, uh, put in the cube for YouTube. It'll take, Q for YouTube. It'll take like a week, uh, two weeks to go live. Um, I'm going to finish up a couple things at work and then I'm going to play that mode. I have not played Lights Out mode yet and it is driving me crazy. I loved the last Lights Out mode and this new one with the candelabras looks amazing. I also love the new killer Dracula that jumps around between bats and dog and uh, the vampire. I'm absolutely looking forward to playing around with that. The problem is that I'm only home for one day. I'm literally here for one day. Uh, and I have to unpack from my last trip from SQL Saturday San Diego. I have to pack for my next trip, going to Boston for a friend's wedding. Uh, and I have a whole bunch of work stuff that I have to knock out before I get out of here too. So I have to kind of uh, hustle with that. CTI Geek says, uh, hi, thanks for uh, subscribing with Prime for several months straight, CTI Geek. Totally appreciate it. And I'm going to hit stop here and then go work on my, i got to go finish a few things at work before I go hop into Deadlight, Dead by Daylight. Uh, but if you see me on Dead by Daylight, my name is define underscore drunk. Define underscore drunk. I don't take any more like friend requests, but it's just always funny to see people and get messages back and forth. So I will see y'all over there in the fog. Adios.